Hello and welcome to my Astronomy Nights, I'm Derek and in this video I'm looking at M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Now M27 is considered the best planetary nebula that you can observe and it's a real gem of the night sky. It's located within a small constellation called Volpecula, which lies within that larger asterism of the Summer Triangle. So it's really well placed this time of year, passing the meridian just after midnight and it gives us a wonderful opportunity to get out and image and photograph this one. So locating this one I used to find really tricky because the star field is really busy. So it's not until I found the little cross of um, Gamma Sagitta that it's become a really easy target to locate. So the trick to this one is to find that Gamma star in Sagitta. So if we start with Albireo and then we're going to move in the direction of Altair 9 degrees. So just about halfway between the two stars and you'll see that arrow shape of Sagitta running uh, west to east and you want to get the brightest star in that which is the gamma star and that'll be the foot of the cross and then the three more little stars to finish off the cross then which are 12, 13 and 14 Vulpeculae and it's 14 is the one we're interested in so that's the easternmost star and it's a magnitude 5.65 uh, so it'll show up really well in binoculars or your finder scope and you just have to look south of that 20 arc minutes and there you'll find that little haze of the Dumbbell Nebula. The Dumbbell Nebula was the first planetary nebula to be discovered and this was by Charles Mezier in 1764 and he added it to his catalogue as the 27th member. It's quite large, it's physically large, it has a diameter of 2.8 light years and it's 1200 light years away so that translates into that large size on our sky of 8 by 5.7 arc minutes and it has that really really interesting shape of kind of an apple core or an hourglass shape with the kind of the two lobes uh, spreading out from that central star. Now it was created by that little central star exploding uh, 48,000 years ago and it spread off those shells of gas as it was going through the end of its life cycle and that gas then is being stimulated by um, ultraviolet light and it gives it those different colors so you have the oxygen and hydrogen giving us the different colors in the photograph and it just makes it really interesting to observe and to image. Now when you're imaging this one you can pick out a lot more of that tenuous gas that fills in the gap so you get more of an oval shape but when you're observing it in the eyepiece you'll see that it's, it's, it's kind of more of an hourglass or a tapered shape and it takes a long time to tease out that uh, gas that fills in the gaps. The Dumbbell Nebula exists because of its central star going through the life cycle and becoming a white dwarf and in the process has cast off all that gas to create the nebula itself. So you can locate that central star, it exists now as a white dwarf and it's just shining at 13.8 magnitude right at the center. But it's, it's a little tricky to pick out, if you were looking at something with equivalent brightness in a, an open part of the sky you'd find it handy enough. But just with that gas in the, in the nebula itself it's kind of obscuring it so it can make it a little tricky to find. Now there's one other interesting star to, to look at within this nebula and it's a variable that I came across when I was researching the nebula for the video and it's called the Goldilocks variable and it's a Myra type variable star and it gets to a maximum of just um, under 14 magnitude so kind of equivalent to that central star. Uh, I haven't been able to visually observe this and I just picked it up in a photo I think just about picked it up and it's a really interesting one to keep an eye on so I'm going to track it and see what kind of length is on this variable star in my photos. So my data for the images on the Dumbbell Nebula were collected over a couple of separate sessions. One was with the GH4 in a previous year and then this year I was managing to get my monochrome camera out on it, the QHY163 mono and I had a pass of RGB filters on it. I had no luck at all with the weather this summer, it was either clouded out or it was only full moon that was clear. So I finally got a decent night with the moon out of the way and I was able to run just about, uh, I think it was just under an hour on each of the passes of the filter. But the image wasn't quite as sharp as I wanted it to be, so I'm going to run it again later in the summer when I have a bit of extra darkness after it passes Meridian. Because I really want a good image for comparing that uh, Goldilocks variable uh, to a later image. The GH5 then was just got on a colour camera, I ran that, it was only an hour and a half I think on the colour image but you can see that it's a slightly sharper image but it doesn't have as much of the gas so I really want to get a better image on the monochrome so I can compare the two properly. 
Now observing the Dumbbell Nebula is fabulous. You can get out with your binoculars, a small refractor or a small reflector, or you can go with some big aperture on it. And each of them shows it uh, really well. Like when you get your binoculars on this one, you can see it as that faint little um, patch below 14 volpeculae. And then if you throw some aperture on it, you can bring out that shape. A uh, smaller fracture doesn't quite show the apple core shape. It's more like a little oval, or you can see that it's kind of tapered. And then when I had my 12 inch on it, then you could really see that uh, lovely um, hourglass shape coming through. And if you spend a little time on it, then at the eyepiece, you'll tease out that little tenuous gas that fills in the gaps and creates that say overall oval shape um, around the, the kind of uh, cut out apple core. So for my observing sessions on M27, I managed to get my small refractor out first during the short nights in the summer. And I was mainly using my 24 millimeter 82 degree eyepiece, which gave me about 20 times magnification. And it's really nice. It's a really nice little oval shape. You can pick it up. You can see that it kind of tapers at the center. Um, you can't fully resolve that hourglass shape, but it still shows up really nicely in that size aperture. Once I was able to get my 12 inch Dobsonian out then after, um, after a month or so when the nights were getting a little darker, I was observing with my 24 millimeter again and it had a really nice frame in that you still had 14 volpecula well inside the frame at both 50 and then when I moved to my 16 millimeter Nirvana it was still holding that star inside the, the field of view it, you could really tease out the um, just that little a hint of the oval with the 16 millimeter um, it tends to get fainter the more magnification you add to it then so when I was putting more magnification on looking for the central star that kind of oval shape was fading away again back towards the hourglass but you could pick up that central star at about 200 magnification with my 12 inch dob it's a really interesting object to observe. I think the nicest view I had was with my 16mm, which is in around uh, 95 or so magnification. And you I could just tease out that full kind of oval shape or rugby ball shape that it has. And um, it's just got so much detail within the actual apple core, the dumbbell as well. So the dumbbell nebula is just a fantastic object to observe. It's really well placed and it has a good window of opportunity throughout the year going from April up to December and you can get binoculars right up to large aperture on it. I find this is just one of the best objects to observe. You can spend hours observing it as well trying to tease out that tenuous gas that sits in along the sides of it and trying to locate the central star as well. So it's got a few nice little um, targets to look for within the nebula itself. Uh, do let me know how you get on with your observations and I look forward to seeing you with the next video. Clear skies.